Welcome back. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about sort of a prelude to apoptosis. So the idea behind this video is DNA, DNA damage. Okay. So there's sort of two uh, kind of classes of this that are sort of not too well defined. But in general, you can have DNA damage where there is a lot of it. So we could have high DNA damage. And you could have some time where there is low amounts of DNA damage, okay? And let's say we have a low amount of DNA damage. And there's a reason I specify low. And what I mean by that is essentially it's low enough and insignificant enough to where the cell can repair it. So whenever you have low DNA damage, the cell activates the mechanisms for DNA repair, okay? But let's say that you have high DNA damage, maybe where the, the damage is too significant. What will end up happening is if the cell realizes that there's too much damage for it to repair, the cell would actually rather die than risk you know, replicating and sending mutated DNA into future generations of cells. So if there's too high of DNA damage, the cell will undergo apoptosis which is programmed cell death. The cell is going to kill itself to prevent mutant DNA from reaching future generations of cell. Okay, so what we're really concerned about in this video is the first case we talked about. Maybe there's low enough DNA damage to where we can actually repair it. Okay, and we're going to talk about the mechanism by which that occurs. So think back to some of the previous videos that we did. Uh, we talked about the regulation of, of basically entry into the S phase of the cell cycle. Well, what did that? Well, that was the complex of CDK2 and cyclin E. That regulated the entry from G1 into the S phase of the cell cycle, right? So CDK2 and cyclin E facilitated that entry, right? So, in other words, whenever I have active CDK2 and cyclin E, that's going to facilitate entry into the S phase, right? So let's think about how that might occur. Well, it's going to occur through a series of processes. And by the way, on the exam, I would give you this picture. You'll, you'll see it in your essays. So when CDK2 cyclin E is activated, it's going to essentially, it's going to phosphorylate this protein called retinoblastic protein. Okay, this is called, this protein is called retino retinoblastic protein okay now what is normally the function of active retinoblastic protein well this version right here this is the active version okay active retinoblastic protein doesn't have a phosphate on it okay so whenever retinoblastic protein is activated it normally inhibits this e2f okay, so let me let me reiterate that Okay, when retinoblastic protein is active, it inhibits E2F. Well, when cyclin-dependent protein kinase 2, CDK2, is activated, it phosphorylates retinoblastic protein. Okay, so it becomes inactive. So in other words, CDK2 phosphorylates retinoblastic protein, making it inactive. That inactivity leads through the same mechanism to an active E2F, okay? So E2F facilitates the synthesis of enzymes needed for DNA replication, and that is what leads to passage from G1 into the S phase, okay? So let me reiterate that. So under normal conditions when there's no mutation, whenever we have the capacity to proceed into the S phase. So CDK2 will phosphorylate and inactivate retinoblastic protein, right? This becomes inactivated. And then what that leads to is an activation. This leads to an activation of E2F. E2F then facilitates the synthesis of enzymes needed for DNA replication, and you ultimately get entry into the S phase of the cell cycle. And this is this only occurs when you have no mutation in the DNA. Okay, so when you have no mutation in the DNA, this is the mechanism by which uh, CDK2 facilitates entry into the S phase from G1 in interphase. 
Okay, and for, in order for that to happen, retinoblastic protein has to be inactivated. But the problem comes whenever you have DNA damage. So DNA damage, one important point to keep in mind, could lead to mutation, which could lead to cancer and ultimately death. So mutations in DNA can be lethal. Okay, so what ends up happening is damage to DNA, it will activate P53. Okay. When P53 becomes activated, it leads to an increase in the synthesis of P21. So in other words, when P53 becomes activated, P21 gets upregulated. So you get, in other words, DNA damage leads to an increase in the concentration of P21. Okay? Now, remember that when there was no mutation, this CDK2 was activated. Okay? But here's the mechanism by which DNA damage causes um, a stalling of the cell cycle. DNA damage leads to an increase in P21. Here's what P21 does. P21 binds to CDK2 and inactivates it. Okay? So when P21 binds to CDK2 along with cyclin E, it becomes an activate. Okay? So CD, CDK2 can no longer phosphorylate retinoblastic protein, okay? So retinoblastic protein is activated. Therefore, retinoblastic protein can inhibit E2F. And when E2F is inhibited, you don't get enzymes needed for DNA synthesis, and you don't get passage to the S phase, therefore. Okay? Let me reiterate. DNA damage activates P53, which leads to an increase, an increase in the synthesis of P21. P21 then inactivates CDK2, which leads to an activation of retinoblastic protein and an inactivation of E2F. Okay, so you don't get enzymes needed for DNA synthesis, and you don't get passage. You don't get passage from G1 phase to the S phase. And the reason that the cell has to do this is because otherwise, if you didn't, the mutations in the DNA will be passed on to future generations. And from a biological perspective, that's definitely what's classified as unfavorable. You don't, the cell is designed to prevent mutation. Now, obviously, it does happen from time to time, but theoretically, the cell is designed to prevent this mutation, and this is the mechanism by which it occurs. So what you should notice is between these two slides, okay, they're the exact opposite of each other. So active CDK2, in the case of DNA damage, you get inactive CDK2 through P21 activation, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And basically the idea behind this is that when you have DNA damage, like I said, you'd like to prevent mutation, prevent propagation of the mutation into future generations of cells. So you repair the DNA um, through stalling the cell cycle. So you stall the cell cycle before it enters the S phase. You fix the DNA, and if the cell is able to fix the DNA, then you reactivate CDK2 and you go into the S phase, right? However, sometimes the DNA damage is too great, okay? When the DNA damage is too great, P53 becomes overactivated. So in other words, you over, you overstimulate, you overstimulate P53. When you overstimulate P53, ultimately what this does is it leads to apoptosis. Okay. So what ends up happening is when the DNA damage is too great, the cell says, okay, rather than risk propagating this DNA that's mutant into future generations of cells, I'm just going to kill myself. I'm going to rid the body of myself to prevent this risk. And so you ultimately activate the pathways for apoptosis. And specifically, that particular pathway is usually mediated either by the extrinsic pathway or the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. Okay, it can be activated by either one. But the idea is you don't want mutation going into future generations of cells because that can lead to cancers and it can lead ultimately to death and be fatal. So if the DNA damage is too great, you do apoptosis. If it's not great enough and the cell is able to fix it, then you simply fix the, fix the damaged DNA and then 
you fix the damaged DNA, and then it'll re that'll reactivate CDK2, and you'll go into the S phase, and the cell cycle will continue like normal. But if the DNA damage is too great, you undergo apoptosis, and the following video is going to be dedicated to apoptosis. So hopefully that video gave you a little bit of intuition on uh, the mechanism by which you stall entry into the S phase. In the next video, we'll talk about caspases and apoptosis. See you in the next video.